turn now to the rise of postmodern interpretation, beginning with a look at the philosophical context that provides the foundation for postmodern thought. As we previously observed, historical criticism embodies modernity's idea that meaning lies in the origin and development of a text. Uh, Postmodernism, on the other hand, finds meaning arising not in the origin or development of the text, but rather in the encounter between the reader and the text. Now, there are two factors that lead to the massive intellectual shift that takes one from historical criticism to postmodern interpretation. One element of that philosophical context is the rise of what we might call the philosophy of language. We don't have time here to do a complete course in the philosophy of language, and and that would be better suited to a philosophy major in any case. But we can at least make some general observations. Perhaps um, One of the people most influential in this regard is a Swiss linguist by the name of Fernand de Saussure. Uh, De Saussure uh, wrote uh, a work called A Course in General Linguistics. It was actually published after his death. And in this book, he attempts to explain how the system that we call language operates. And so, because he sees it as a system, Saussure recognizes that the elements of a language relate to one another, and in their relationships to one another, uh, they give rise to meaning. So, uh, but Saussure sees this differently than the traditional historical understanding of language. So, he talks about language as linguistic signs. Whether that's written language or spoken language, uh, we can think in terms of a signifier, the token within the language, verbal or written, and the signified, that which is designated by the signifier. Now, this differs from classical language understanding in which words are associated with things. And earlier in our discussion, in passing, we saw this idea of words associated with things in the writings of Thomas Aquinas. Uh, If we went back and explored further, we could see how it operated within Aristotle and especially within Plato, for whom words point to things in the realm of ideas. But but for Saussure, uh, words do not point to things. Rather, they are symbols, linguistic symbols, which signify something uh, in the mind of the speaker writer and also in the mind of the reader or hearer. And meaning, then, does not arise directly from the word, but indirectly because the word functions in a certain way within the system in which it operates. Um, In other words, meaning is derived from the place of that linguistic token in the structure of language. And there are two, at least two elements to this structure. One is the structure of the language and the writing, whether, again, language, whether written or spoken, we might refer to this as the linguistic context, but there's also a cultural context that determines the way that words are used and the meaning with which they're invested. And for Saussure, one key element is the question of why a speaker or writer has adopted one word as opposed to another word. And so part of the meaning of a word is dependent upon its difference from other words not chosen, which are sometimes described as the binary opposites of that word. Now, later structuralists extended these ideas of de Saussure into other fields, recognizing that this idea of the operation of a system applies to other fields 
domains besides language. And so we get the development of structural anthropology by Claude Lévi-Strauss, uh, and literary structuralism by Roland Barthes, Jacques Derrida, and others. But within the realm of biblical studies, structuralism per se has not played all that great of a role, probably because if it were taken seriously, structuralism would render virtually all ancient text unreadable. Because even though we know a great deal more now about the ancient world than we knew a century or two ago, Essentially, we have still very little understanding of the system of language and culture that gives rise to the text that we have. And so in many ways, we lack the information about the structure that it would make it possible for us to interpret text correctly. So structuralism, uh, while it has made some well, it's had some influence in the field of hermeneutics, um, has not led to practical developments um, within the realm of biblical studies that have been all that profound. Another approach to the philosophy of language uh, that is non-structuralist in its emphasis comes from the Austrian philosopher and uh, mathematician and logician Ludwig Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein uh, taught uh, at Cambridge University. Uh, he had his, his roots were in mathematics and logic, and so he approaches the problem of language from a different direction than that of de Saussure. Um, the whole story of the development of Wittgenstein's thought and his life um, is told in, gener in layman's terms, in popular form, in the book, uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, The Duty of Genius, written in 1991. It's a very interesting book, and uh, I strongly encourage you to read it at some point. One of the problems with interpreting Wittgenstein is that he wrote very little. The only major work of his that was published during his lifetime was his doctoral dissertation, the Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus, which was published in 1921. Um, the problem with the tractate is that Wittgenstein himself changed his views over time so that um, the mature Wittgenstein rejects many of the ideas that occur in the tractatus. And so um, while it represents an important step in the development of Wittgenstein's thought, it doesn't represent his mature reflections on the nature of language and its use. For that, we might have to turn to a later book that was not actually directly written by Wittgenstein. Uh, as I said, he didn't publish uh, anything other than the Tractatus during his lifetime. And so um, for decades, uh, his students at Cambridge collected notes uh, and uh, shared them with one another, uh, notes from his lectures. And Wittgenstein had written several books that were incomplete at the time of his death, um, and so one of his students, Elizabeth Anscum, uh, took um, the un incomplete manuscript of philosophical investigations uh, and supplements it with material from Wittgenstein's lectures, which she integrates uh, and produces something like a, a, a completed work. Uh, but this was published after, after Wittgenstein's death but it does reflect his more mature thought. Nevertheless, Wittgenstein is still very difficult to read because of his writing style. But his ideas are basically simple enough that we can summarize them, hopefully without oversimplifying them. Uh, one chief observation of Wittgenstein is that there are no real philosophical problems. Now, this might seem like an odd position for a philosopher to take, but Wittgenstein's point is that what we tend to call philosophical problems are primarily problems of language. And this led Wittgenstein into a, a rather famous conflict with another philosopher, Karl Popper. Uh, and according to the legend, uh, Wittgenstein and Popper got into a violent argument one evening when Popper was a guest lecturer at, at uh, 
Cambridge uh, to a small group of students in Wittgenstein's rooms um, that led to Wittgenstein threatening Popper with a fireplace poker um, and the two having to be separated. So it seemed like an odd thing for philosophers, but it continues to be a uh, you know fascinating story and a snapshot in how Wittgenstein differs uh, in such fundamental ways from other philosophers of the 20th century. For Wittgenstein, philosophy was what he liked to call language gone on holiday. In other words, it was language that wasn't actually doing what language was intended and designed to do. Wittgenstein's understanding of language differs from that of de Saussure's in that Wittgenstein takes a functional approach rather than a systemic approach to talking about language and meaning. So for Wittgenstein, meaning is dependent upon what he calls the language game that is being played. And meaning goes astray, that is, meaning is confused or lost, when participants in a discourse are playing different language games. And so the need to clarify the language game and establish the rules of the language game are important to ensure that meaning is effectively communicated between participants in the dialogue. But there are also other ways in which language can give rise to confused or mistaken meaning. And the other major way is that when language is used for a purpose for which it is not suited. For Wittgenstein, this primarily means metaphysical statements because Wittgenstein held that all metaphysical statements were ultimately meaningless because language does not have the mechanisms uh, and humans don't have the experience to talk about metaphysical issues. Language is limited to the experience in this world. The metaphysics is by its very nature outside the scope of this world. And so uh, as it relates to metaphysics, uh, the last sentence of Wittgenstein's Tractatus summarizes the view that he continues to hold, namely, uh, of that which one cannot speak, one must be silent. So um, we have these two different approaches to the philosophy of language, the structuralist approach of de Saussure and the functional approach of Wittgenstein. And while neither of them has a direct bearing on how biblical interpretation uh, shifts from the modernist to the postmodernist approach, um, the influence of these things combined with another factor namely uh, developments in epistemology and the application of epistemology uh, come to be significantly contributory to the rise of postmodernism. As far as the epistemological issues are concerned, probably the chief figure here that we need to be aware of is the German philosopher Immanuel Kant. Kant, an 18th century philosopher from the city of Königsberg. We describe him as German, although his, his home city has been at various times part of Germany and Poland and Russia uh, since his day, but he certainly saw himself as German. Um, his most uh, important work is known in English as the Critique of Pure Reason. And in this book, Kant took on the challenge of attempting to resolve uh, a fundamental epistemological conflict, uh, that between rationalism, which held the view that the world could be apprehended through the operation of the mind, uh, and empiricism, which claimed that the world could be perceived and understood only in terms of the, the uh, senses and the data which comes to us through the senses. Now, if Wittgenstein is hard to understand, Kant is even more obtuse, which gives rise to cartoons like this one, in which the cartoon figure says Kant's one of his favorite authors, and he learned German just for the purpose of reading Kant, but it turns out that it didn't help because German and Kantonian are actually two different languages. But at the end, uh, that's why uh, our cartoon philosopher loves Kant, because he doesn't have to decide whether to agree with him or not, because it's impossible to understand him. However, 
Having said that, it is possible to present the basics of Kant's view in a relatively straightforward way. Kant maintains that there is a real world which actually exists, and there are things in this world which have reality to them. Um, and these things are perceived by an observer. Um, and according to the uh, empiricist model, the impressions which the observer receives through the operation of the senses are stored in the mind. And Kant agrees with that. Everything we know about the world comes to us through the senses, Kant says. However, unlike most of empiricism um, and like most rationalism, Kant maintains that the mind is not simply a passive recorder of data from the senses, but rather the mind is active. Uh, it works on the data to construct an understanding of the world on the basis of the data that comes through the senses. So for Kant, there is a real world out there and we perceive that world by the senses and our mind functions to combine the data from the senses into a picture of reality that exists in our mind. The problem is that picture doesn't always correspond exactly to the reality that exists out there. Um, so for Kant, there's a real world that's perceived by um, a reader, hearer, speaker, uh, perceiver. Uh, the perceptions that come to us through the senses are manipulated by the active processes of the mind, which produce a picture of the world uh, within our mind. The problem that Kant recognizes is that all you can really know is the picture of the world that your mind creates. You can never really know the world in and of itself. And while Kant didn't go any further than that, because he was simply trying to find a way to reconcile um, rationalism and empiricism into a unified model, others who have come after Kant have taken his basic observations and gone in a different direction with them. So following this approach, some have concluded that since as Kant indicates, all knowledge is internal to us. Uh, as a result of that, no one has the right to make an authoritative claim for someone else. And it's this recognition, uh, particularly as it's combined with observations about the way that language works, that moves the philosophical model of interpretation from the modernist model of historical criticism to the postmodernist model in the last quarter of the 20th century. And so we'll turn now from the philosophical context to a consideration of postmodern interpretation itself. Mm -hmm.